Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're having a look at a fascinating piece of vintage recording equipment. This is a Webster Chicago Model 80 wire recorder. Now, wire recorders are the original magnetic audio recording technology, predating the more familiar tape recorder by about 50 years. However, the operating principle is exactly the same. In a tape recorder, you have a flexible plastic tape coated in ferrite, and as it passes through the recording head, an electromagnet will convert an audio signal into a series of magnetic pulses, which are then encoded onto the ferrite. When the tape passes back through the machine for playing, a magnetic pickup will then pick up these magnetic pulses and convert them into an electric and then an audio signal. A wire recorder works exactly the same way, only instead of a coated plastic tape, it uses a thin steel wire. Now, this technology was pioneered in 1898 by a Danish inventor named Valdemar Poulsen. However, his early model didn't use the familiar reel-to-reel -reel architecture. Rather, he wrapped his steel wire around a cylindrical drum. And this was in imitation of the most common recording technology at the time, which was the Edison wax cylinder phonograph. And for more information on those, please check out the video I did with the Dalnavert Museum on that subject, link in the description. Now, Poulsen first exhibited his invention at the 1900 Universal Exposition in Paris, where he happened to record the voice of none other than Emperor Franz Josef of Austria. And this is actually the oldest magnetic audio recording that still exists. Now, after this, Poulsen made a number of improvements to his invention, including going to a more familiar reel-to-reel -reel format, and soon began licensing the design all around the world. And some of the first companies in North America to produce and sell wire recorders were the Telegraphone Company of Springfield, Massachusetts, the Brush Development Company of Cleveland, Ohio, and the Armour Research Foundation of Chicago, Illinois. And at first, these machines were mainly sold as competitors to the Dictaphone, which was a wax cylinder-based dictation machine for office use marketed by the Edison Company. Now, at first glance, the Telegraphone had a number of key advantages over the Dictaphone. Number one, it was more information dense. You could store a lot more audio on a relatively small reel of magnetic wire than you could on a wax cylinder, which were typically limited to around four minutes of playtime. Uh, you could also reuse magnetic wire over and over again, whereas a cylinder, once you used it once, you had to shave down the wax to expose a fresh surface, and you could only do this about three or four times before you ran out of wax and you had to throw out the cylinder and buy a new one. Unfortunately, however, uh, the one dimension on which the early wire recorders could not compete with the dictaphone was price. They were just far too expensive and complicated and unreliable to be commercially successful. However, the greatest period of development for wire recorders was the Second World War, where they were used in a number of interesting applications, including Operation Titanic. And this was part of the larger Operation Bodyguard, Operation Fortitude Deceptions, meant to fool the Germans into thinking that the Operation Overlord landings would occur at the Pas de Calais and not the beaches of Normandy. And as part of this operation, units of the British Special Air Service, or SAS, parachuted into the Calais region carrying wire recorders and recordings of battle sounds, uh, small arms fire, mortar fire, men shouting, in order to stir up chaos behind the lines and make the Germans believe that a large airborne force had landed in the region. Now, thanks to the technical development that wire recorders underwent during the war, by the time the war ended, they were finally reliable and affordable enough to become commercially viable. And here we get to the history of the Webster Chicago Corporation. So Webster Chicago was founded by one Rudolf Blasch, who was born in Germany and emigrated to the United States in 1904. In 1914, he founded the Webster Novelty Company in Chicago, which mainly sold phonographs. However, over the next couple of years, the company expanded and diversified, and by the Second World War was selling a whole range of electric and audio equipment record changers, radio batteries, PA systems, tools and dies, inverters, things like that. And during the war, they actually became a licensee of the aforementioned Armour Research Foundation and became one of the first companies post-war to sell wire recorders. And 
Although these were initially sold as they were in the early 1900s as dictation machines for offices, Webster Chicago actually started marketing them towards ordinary people and families, and they touted them as a form of electronic memory that you could use to record all of your most cherished moments, such as you know, band recitals, birthday parties, weddings, things like that. And to this end, they actually created an interesting marketing strategy, which was to create the Wire Spondence Club in 1950. This is basically a pen pal club where instead of writing a letter, you would record a short message on a wire recorder and send the reel by mail to whichever recipient you were communicating with. And apparently this was inspired by an employee of Webster Chicago uh, who communicated with his mother who was trapped behind the Berlin blockade in 1948 in this fashion. And it was highly successful. Within two years, the club had almost 2,000 members across 35 countries and all 48 states at the time. And it was thanks to marketing campaigns like this that the Webster Corporation was able to sell large numbers of wire recorders. In fact, between 1947 and 1948, they sold around 40,000 of them. Now, this was one of their most popular models. This is, like I said, the Model 80. So let's actually have a closer look at this and see exactly how this works. Right, so here we have the unit in its entirety. So let's look at some of the main features and controls starting from the top. Right, so at the top here, we have the spindle for our wire reel. We have our recording and playhead, which is encased in this Bakelite cover. And we have our take-up reel. Now moving down, we have our main controls. Our on-off switch is integrated into the tone dial. So it clicks on and you can adjust it like that. Here we have our output selector. Uh, position one is the internal speaker. Position two is amplifier output to an external speaker, which comes out through this plug here. And position three is direct output from the playhead in case you wanna run it through an external amplifier. This little neon lamp here is for use during recording and it gives you a visual indication of the audio going into the microphone. We have our two positions for record or listen. We have our volume control here. And finally, we have our input plug for an external microphone. And finally, in the middle here, we have our controls for play and rewind. And to operate this, you have to push down these little detents here and push the switch from one side to the other. And we'll look at how this actually works mechanically in a second. Now, the unit actually comes with a hinged lid that can be completely removed. And inside the lid, we have storage for three spare reels, as well as a compartment that holds our accessories. We have our external microphone, and I absolutely love the design of this. It's so wonderfully Art Deco. We have our output cable for running the audio to an external speaker or amplifier. And finally, our power cord, which plugs into the back of the machine as so. Right, so let's go through how to load the machine. First, you take the take-up spool and turn it until the playhead is at its highest position. The playhead actually moves up and down during playing and recording in order to distribute the wire more evenly on either spool. Now, once it's at its highest position, you take your wire and the factory fresh spools will have a little piece of thread at the end for starting. You pass it through the slot in the front of the playhead and then over to the take-up spool through this notch. Then you press this button in the middle. That's going to lift up this little latch here. You feed the wire underneath it and let it go, and that's just going to pinch it into place. Then you back everything up until it's nice and tensioned, and you're ready to play. All right, so let's turn on the unit. Wait for the tubes in the amplifier to warm up. Make sure that it's on output one, which is the internal speaker. Make sure it's on listen and not record. And make sure our volume is turned all the way up. And finally, we turn the switch to play. So one of the things you'll notice is the great speed at which the wire travels through the machine, around 24 inches or two feet per second. And this is significantly faster than on a typical tape recorder. And what it means is that you need a considerable amount of wire to record a relatively small amount of audio. 
So for example, recording one hour of audio on a wire recorder requires 2.2 kilometers of wire. However, just to give you an idea of how incredibly thin this wire is, that 2.2 kilometers can comfortably fit on one of these three inch reels. Now, something else you'll notice is the relatively poor quality of the audio. There's a lot of distortion here. And one of the primary reasons for that was uneven encoding of the magnetic signal onto the wire. So the early machines had the recording head mounted on one side of the wire. But if the wire twisted as it went through the playhead, this would cause a lot of distortion. So the later machines instead used a V-shaped recording head so that the magnetic field would wrap more evenly around the wire. But even then you still got some twisting and thus some distortion. Right, and now to rewind, you simply flip the switch to the other side. Now, interestingly, this doesn't have any sort of cutoff switch to disconnect the amplifier and speaker from the playhead when you rewind. So, you now know what hell sounds like. Now, something I would love to be able to show you is the record feature on this, but unfortunately there seems to be a broken connection or some other fault in the circuit that I can't quite find. Uh, the microphone just doesn't work, nothing records onto the wire, so that will have to wait for another day. However, what I can do is open up this lid and actually show you how the mechanism works on the inside. So why don't we do that? All right, let's remove this panel here. You can see that the motor drives this friction wheel here constantly throughout operation. And when you move this switch from one side to the other, you're going to be moving that friction wheel against either one or the other, driving either the feed spool or the take-up reel. So for example, if I turn this to play or record, it's going to drive the pickup spool while dragging the feed spool. And to do that, it's going to also release a brake here on the pickup spool and apply a brake on the feed spool. And then it's the same in reverse. When I turn it to rewind, it is going to push the wheel over to drive the feed spool and it's going to drag the pickup spool by applying a brake. And that is how a magnetic wire recorder works. Now, unfortunately, despite the early successes of companies like Webster Chicago, the heyday of the wire recorder was very brief, lasting from around 1945 to 1955, when the technology was almost completely superseded by magnetic tape. Now, magnetic tape has a number of disadvantages compared to magnetic wire, the main one being storage density. So because tape can only stack in one direction, uh, whereas a magnetic wire can actually stack in two, you can store a lot more data in a more compact package on magnetic wire. However, magnetic tape has a number of other advantages that far outweigh this one fault. Uh, for example, as I mentioned before, there's no way of controlling the orientation of the magnetic wire as it goes through the play or recording head, so you tend to get a lot of distortion. With a magnetic tape, on the other hand, it goes through at a controlled orientation and thus suffers from less distortion. Also, there's the problem of what happens when the recording wire or tape breaks. I can tell you from personal experience working with this unit, when the wire gets tangled or when it breaks, it is a real mess. You really can't untangle the snarl. The best thing to do is just cut it and keep moving on. With a tape, however, it's a lot more forgiving in this respect. There's also the problem of splicing. Say your wire breaks or you want to splice a couple of audio clips together. The only real way of doing that is to tie a knot, and that knot can cause a very loud pop or other form of distortion as it passes through the playhead. Whereas a piece of tape you can simply glue together with minimal distortion, so it's a lot easier for audio editing. And for these and other reasons, magnetic tape very quickly took over the audio and data recording market. However, wire recorders did stick around for a number of decades in very specialized applications. For example, they were used in early flight data recorders for aircraft because the wire was far more resilient and heat resistant than a magnetic tape. They were also used for data recording in satellites and space probes for many years. And in the 1960s, 
a German company named Profona produced the Minifon, which was a subcompact wire recorder that was used by a number of intelligence agencies, including the CIA, the KGB, and the East German Stasi. And because of the high uh, data density of magnetic wire, you could store up to five hours of audio on this tiny recorder. And it came with a whole bunch of neat James Bond-esque accessories, such as a shoulder holster so you could fit it under your coat, as well as a watch with a built-in microphone and a wire that ran down your sleeve. Now, you're probably wondering what happened to the Webster Chicago Corporation. Well, in 1956, Rudolf Blasch died, but then the company kept going for about a decade until 1967, when they were forced to file for bankruptcy due to unprofitable government contracts and competition in the electronics market from other countries, especially Japan. So that was the end of that. Anyway... That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet more fascinating recording devices and other equipment just like this. This was a fun one to have a look at. This is just a beautiful piece of industrial design and just a neat and very obscure portion of audio recording history. So really fun to have a look at this. Anyways, until next time, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.